Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the British Institute in Eastern Africa's annual lecture. It's a pleasure to have you all uh, with us this evening. I am Professor Henrietta Moore, and I am the president of the British Institute in Eastern Africa. Uh, I want to start first, before I introduce our speaker this evening, just by saying a couple of words about the uh, BIA for those of you who may not be familiar with what we do. So the British Institute in Eastern Africa is one of the international research institutes of the British Academy. We have existed since 1960 with a mandate to conduct, support and facilitate research across the humanities and social sciences in Eastern Africa and across the continent. Today, we support projects taking place all across the African continent. And in particular, we support researchers at all stages of their careers through innovative funding and training opportunities. And we run a series of uh, dynamic workshops, conferences, uh, and other kinds of events. And if you haven't had uh, a chance to see the work that we do and the important the research that we do in collaboration with our African uh, colleagues and with networks right across Africa, uh, I invite you to um, look at our website, keep an eye open for the relevant website announcements and join us uh, and take part in all that we do. So tonight I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our speaker, Professor Ambrina Manji. Professor Manji is Professor of Land, Law and Development at Cardiff University and former director and now trustee of the British Institute in Eastern Africa. Her research is in the area of African law and society. It's strongly interdisciplinary and includes and involves law in relationships with African literature, African history, legal education, and in particular women and the law. And her most recent book is entitled The Struggle for Land and Justice in Kenya. And it explores, amongst many other things, why new land laws have not addressed those long-standing grievances relating to grossly unequal land distribution in that country. The book is a finalist for the US African Studies Association Best Book Prize uh, in 2021. Um, and at Cardiff University, where Professor Manji is now based, she co-founded the Law and Global Justice Center. And her current research so I'm told, is a study of the political economy of care in Africa, which is an innovative uh, approach, which I'm much looking forward to hearing more about on another occasion. Professor Manji was also president of the African Studies Association of the UK, and she's editor of African Affairs. And she's going to talk to us tonight uh, on the theme of dispossession is nine tenths of the law. So, Ambrina, please, can I welcome you to give your annual lecture and open the floor to you. Thank you very much indeed, Henrietta. Thank you, uh, all uh, colleagues. Good evening and thank you for, for being here. It's very good uh, to have with us so many old friends and, and many new ones, uh, including uh, students on the BIA's uh, year-long uh, Introduction to Research Processes course, students of Kabarak Law School in uh, both constitutional law and land law modules, a number of PhD researchers, distinguished scholars of Eastern Africa from across disciplines, uh, the former president of the Kenya Supreme Court and uh, Chief Justice Emeritus, Professor William Mutunga, Dean of Kabarak Law School, Professor John Osogombani, uh, my very dear friends, Yash Palgai and Jill Gai, uh, to all of you, very welcome. I should say just before I begin that um, I've prepared um, this evening's slides very much as a guide to, to further reading and, and references that that some of you may wish to take up, very much inspired by the BIA's Introduction to Research Processes um, course and to the enthusiasm of the students that we've had with us in the past month. Um, and just to say that we will um, make sure to circulate these slides for you um, after the lecture. In that chapter on land in uh, the landmark 1970 text, uh, entitled Public Law and Political Change in Kenya, Yash Palgai and Patrick McCausland wrote that no part 
uh, of the law of Kenya has raised stronger emotions over the years than the law relating to land and its administration. And none is of more importance at present. This remains true today, more than 50 years after that book was published. We're faced with intractable land problems, including inequitable concentration of land in the hands of the wealthy, a propensity to land grab, unresolved historical land injustices, and land hunger. For some years now, I've been working on theoretical frameworks for discussions of land, which to adapt Upendra Bakshi, himself adapting Ronald Dworkin, takes justice seriously. That land reform is a key idea in Kenyan history is beyond doubt. Nonetheless, land reform can mean many things. I've been interested in how land reform has come to be reduced to land law reform. This has excluded critical debates. It has foreclosed discussions of redistributive politics. And it has drawn attention away from insurgent ideas about land. The official archive of land mischiefs committed by the state, by politicians and by the elite have been made available over the years by a series of official reports. But beyond this, Kenyans have not been shy to develop a people's truth on land, creating what Grace Musila has described as alternative epistemic registers on land. Demands for constitutional change uh, and land justice have become connected in Kenya. There are dangers inherent in this. In addition, our constitutional optimism has meant that land redistribution has been carefully and very diligently excluded from discussions of what is possible. Indeed, Kenya's Gini coefficient on land has worsened since the inauguration of the 2010 constitution. Yet it's not possible to envisage the present day economic structure of Kenya without acknowledging its deep roots in regimes of land ownership that have, were facilitated first by a settler political economy and then post-independence by an elite that has reserved for itself access to ownership of land on a massive scale. I want to suggest in this lecture that land wrongs, properly understood, do not fit the neat temporal categories of law and policy constructed around the sorts of terms we've become used to using, such as historical land injustice, a legal term about which I'll say a little bit more in due course. Instead, the, process, the, the proceeds rather of land wrongs circulate and recirculate in the economy. Current land injustices shape Kenya's political economy. Our understanding of present day land injustices must be understood by reference to the history of the acquisition of the protectorate and the colony. Land and administration were key to the colonial uh, endeavor. In their analysis of the legal framework of colonial power in Kenya, Yash Gai and Patrick McCausland, uh, in their chapter on land, set out uh, the way in which agrarian administration worked. And this chapter bears rereading and careful analysis now more than 50 years after it was written. And I should mention that because the book is out of print, there are many of us in this room uh, today lobbying very hard for a reprint of what we see as a key text. From 1895, East African protectorate status meant that local inhabitants were foreigners, not British subjects. But nonetheless, sufficient powers were needed to ensure effective government could be assumed in the protectorate. Gradually, through the East African order, orders and council, power was acquired to administer the protectorate. An important obstacle remained, however, the protectorate status didn't automatically allow the alienation of land in the territory. And so the ability of the British government to attract settlers by alienating land was impeded. In 1896, therefore, the Indian Land Acquisition Act was extended uh, to the East African protectorate. This permitted land to be acquired for public purposes, such as the building of the railway. Land regulations passed in 1897 stipulated that outside of the 10-mile-wide coastal strip, 
uh, in the control of the Sultan of Zanzibar. In the remainder of the protectorate, certificates of occupancy for a period of 99 years could be issued. Guy and McCausland argue that this was a largely unattractive offer, a mere license to use land that didn't lead to great interest in European settlement. And so in 1899, a different interpretation of the principle of unoccupied land in the protectorate was offered by the British government's law officers. This new interpretation amounted to saying that by assuming the protectorate, the Crown assumed the right to deal in waste and unoccupied land. This was a change in the 1833 advice given to the British government that had cautioned that the acquisition of a protectorate didn't lead to the power to alienate land there, unless rights to waste unoccupied la and unoccupied land had been specifically reserved in a treaty or agreement. In 1901, the East Africa Lands Order in Council was promulgated and had the effect of vesting Crown land in the protectorate in the Commissioner and the Consul General. They held it in trust for the Crown and could make it available in grants or leases. A year later, a further extension was accomplished through, through the Crown's, Crown Lands Ordinance, which laid out that sales of land and 99-year leases could be offered, opening the way for large-scale European settlement. In 1915, the Crown Lands Ordinance extended the, de the definition of Crown Lands beyond just public land uh, to say that it also uh, included land occupied by native tribes. In a few years, therefore, control over land and the protectorate had been comprehensively acquired such that complete legal power was exercisable by the Crown. Land could be widely and easily alienated for settlers. And as Guy and McCausland put it, the disinheritance of Africans from their land was uh, complete. And those of us who studied in law schools will know that uh, Agoth Ogendo referred uh, to this as uh, the, the institution of a position of Africans as tenants of the crown. Kenyan land policy was racialized at its inception. Its structure was bifurcated. Guy and McCausland described the pattern of land and agrarian administration from 1902 as a dual policy. Between 1902 and 1960, law, law policy and administrative practice maintained one policy for African settlement and another for Africa, uh, for European settlement rather, and another for African reserves. Racial exclusivity in the colony centered on European control of land in the highlands. Towards the end of this period, Guy and McCausland show, there was a slow move away from the dual system as Africans began to find representation in political institutions. But from 1902 until the Second World War, the demands of Europeans uh, dominated for land on attractive terms, for spatial control of Africans and their herds, for policies to hinder their agricultural competitiveness with European farmers, and for cheap and plentiful labour. Kenyan land politics was in essence redistributive in this period, in the sense that in what the historian Atieno of the Umbo terms a conquest state, dispossession of some was necessary for the accumulation of land by others. The colonization of Kenya centered on the redistribution of land from Africans to Europeans, the banning of Africans from owning the most fertile and productive land, and the disbarment of Africans from growing cash crops that might compete with colonial agriculture. In particular, the racial exclusivity of the highlands was sacrosanct. Guy and McCausland describe it as the arc of the European covenant. On this reading, efforts to address the resulting skewed ownership and control of land that was a legacy of colonialism were necessarily a part of the political settlement entailed in decolonization. This was or should have been tied up with ending colonial subjugation, asserting rights to territorial space, and importantly, demanding ontological recognition. Uh, moving now to the process of, of decolonization, and in particular to Kenya's program of, of, um, 
of land resettlement in what the post-colonial literary theorist Neil Lazarus has described as the cusp colonial period. What we see in this period is a process of undoing land dispossession, uh, but a process that, was, that, that seemed to offer economic solutions to what was essentially a political problem as ways were sought to avert unrest and forestall political radicalism. A ready response to the announcement in 1960 that independence would be forthcoming in the near future was promoted by technocrats who worked in the land development and settlement boards. Kenya's resettlement program was rapidly constructed. Bates, Robert Bates writes that by the time the revolutionary forces from below and the pressures from Whitehall from above had made independence inevitable, officials had crafted plans for the transfer of lands from Europeans to African ownership in such detail that they could be circulated on international capital markets, appraised and funded to the tune of 20 million pounds, all within a few months. The aim was to address European anxieties about impending independence. The result of intensive lobbying by European farmers with significant illiquid assets, the settlement schemes which were constructed became a means to underwrite European farm assets and or to allow them to sell their land at what they considered to be reasonable prices. Under these schemes, land was chosen that would enable smallholders with experience of successful farming to expand onto high quality agricultural land with high potential. And we know various schemes were, were created about which I won't say too much this evening, except to note that there has been in recent years uh, a real increase in interest in uh, the history of settlement schemes, just to uh, draw your attention to two really important texts recently published uh, on the settlement schemes. And I'm pleased to say, I think both of these texts are in the BIA uh, library and, and, and would, I think, really merit the attention of, of those interested in, in Kenya's land questions. The question of how to fund these programs was a considerable issue for the British government. It hoped that the assistance of the World Bank would release it, Britain, from the responsibility of having to oversee the repayment of any loans after it had departed Kenya. The World Bank, on its part, required that any loans be for the development of the economy and not for mere transfer of ownership. And so land with high potential that grew tea, coffee, pyrethrum, for example, was prioritized for transfer to men with farming experience, managerial capacity, and adequate financial resources. The financing of the scheme played an important symbolic role. If in financing the scheme, the World Bank insisted that the program was concerned with economic development, not with the transfer of land ownership, the British, for their part, saw payment for land as strongly signalling that Africans would not be permitted under any circumstances to acquire former European lands for free. This structure was accepted and endorsed by President Kenyatta in the face of more militant insistence that Africans should not pay to get back land in the White Highlands and that it was not for the British to pay, play any part in the making of land policy. The militants argued that Kenya should not be saddled with any debts for regaining African land from Europeans and called for a boycott of the settlement schemes. To accept that Britain should call the shots on the terms of European departure from the White Highlands was to Kenya, Kenyatta's opponents an unacceptable compromise. And here many of us again uh, don't need to be reminded of, of, of Bildad Kagea and, uh, and his uh, position on uh, the land issue. But nonetheless, I wanted to remind us of John Ilip's wonderful reading uh, of, of uh, the, the so-called what have you done for yourself speech. Um, as Karuti Kanyinga has written, a radical faction rooted in the nationalist position on land championed Nyakua, 
referring to the wholesale seizure of expropriated lands in the White Highlands to settle the landless and the squatters who'd lived in the Rift Valley for decades. The radicals opposed the very principles of land reform as presented by Kenyatta, chiefly the requirement that the landless raise deposits and loans to reacquire property which was theirs. But Kenyatta was determined to pursue an accommodationist path and the radical position on land was duly suppressed. For colonial administrators departing Kenya, great symbolic significance was attached to the honoring of loans. The insurgent nationalist demand that land forcibly and unjustly taken should be returned for free could not be seen to be indulged. For the new Kenyan government, concerns about the country's credit rating made it critical that they be rid of the debt. On all sides, those involved knew that, as Harbison put it, uh, the, loan, the loans had been contracted by the colonial administration in deference to European rather than to African interests. Land reform in this period um, was thus what, what Harbison describes as a, a European colonial defence strategy. Land settlement was political settlement. Kenya's leaders who emerged out of this settlement would cooperate in the preservation of European interests. And as Kariti Kanyinga rightly points out, this period saw the defeat of a radical movement by an emerging elite uh, which cons consolidated, its, consolidated its power through controlling both land and, importantly, the dominant, dominant ideologies of land. Taking racial form in the colonial period, after independence, an African elite didn't institute a radical break with this model of land relations. From a political and a sociological and not just a legal point of view, the nature of the colonial state, which, which Yash Gai has described as being without a trace of constitutionalism, is linked to the subsequent predatory nature of its descendant, the independent state. For those of us interested in conservatism in other domains, including in personal laws in the present day, it's worth joining the dots here. Bates and his study has convincingly shown how rural transformation in the White Highlands and the native reserves were about political struggles over land rights, but were also importantly about family struggles over kinship. In the 1950s, the legal struggles that took place over entitlements to land were overseen by and benefited those families with a foothold in the new social order. Rural entrepreneurs, those able to read and write, clerks, colonial bureaucrats, those with urban jobs. A conservative bent about property rights and by extension family was built into the new order as it was under construction. I want to turn now to what must surely be an exemplary case of colonial and post-colonial injustice relating to land. Uh, related to dispossession and the loss of a way of life. The colonial legal struggles of the Maasai illustrates the ontological and material harms of settler colonialism that were inherited and deepened by the post-colonial state. The two treaties signed between the Maasai and the British colonial authorities in 1904 and 1911 constituted the earliest concrete taking of land or colonial expropriation in Kenya. A century later, the question of the legality of the anglo maasai treaties is still under discussion. This is a case of a long-standing land-related injustice grounded in contested law. Whereas in pre-colonial times, the Maasai lived on both sides of the Rift Valley escarpment, with the advent of colonialism, the Maasai steadily lost territory. In 1904, and again in 1911, at the point of a gun, they were moved from land that was discovered to be eminently suitable for settlers. Joel Googi notes perceptively that the consequence of this was more than simply the loss of territory. Since land relationships are an incident of the total culture of a people, and the culture is in turn shaped by a people's way of life, 
which is influenced by the ecological conditions of the areas they occupy, what Lotta Hughes has called the moving of the Maasai denoted uh, the destruction a way of, of a way of life. In Ole Jogo and others, the Maasai challenged the legal basis of their removal from their ancestral lands. In 1904, senior members of the Maasai had agreed to vacate land and be regrouped in two areas. The agreement stipulated that Europeans would not be allowed to take up these lands in newly created settlements. That agreement was to subsist for seven years. Recognizing the value of the land being thus occupied by the Maasai, settlers began immediately to press for access to it and for increased white reservation of the land. And in 1911, a further violent moving of the Maasai was carried out. In the 1914 case, brought on behalf of some of those who'd been made to move in 1911, the plaintiff argued, plaintiffs argued, amongst other things, that the, the 1911 agreement was not made uh, with Maasai capable of binding the whole tribe. In addition, interestingly, damages in tort were sought for confiscation of cattle during the move. In response, the Crown argued that the courts had no jurisdiction because in 1904 and 1911, those agreements made were not contracts, they were treaties. What had occurred in the taking of the cattle, alleged to be a tort, was not in fact a tort, but an act of state. Neither of these matters could be ruled upon in a municipal court. Both at first instance and later in the East African Court of Appeal, these arguments were successful. In essence, the argument that was constructed was that the Maasai were a sovereign entity. This meant that they were capable of, capable of entering into a treaty and crucially of surrendering, surrendering their land through a treaty. The Maasai's vestigial of um, sovereignty retained by them after the country had been uh, taken over enabled them to make a treaty. How did the court come to this conclusion? that the Maasai had retained a residual sovereignty. It argued that radical title to their territory was vested in them and remained so. The argument, Guy and McCaws did point out in their text, was circular. To the question, can the Maasai make a treaty? The answer was yes, because they retain an element of sovereignty. And to the question, what element of sovereignty do the, do the Maasai retain? The answer was the treaty-making element. Happily for the colonial regime, it was found that the agreements were not civil contracts and no remedy could be afforded by a municipal court for wrongs that might have been done in the removal of the Maasai from their land. The absurdity of this position is summed up by Guy and McCausland in their observation that it amounted to ruling that the Maasai retained sufficient sovereignty to make a treaty, but not to make a civil contract about land. The case was in keeping with a line of, line of findings that showed that the courts were unwilling to allow challenges to the legal base of colonialism. In a protectorate declared in 1895, the Maasai were nonetheless accorded sufficient sovereignty to sign away their land. In the acerbic assessment of Guy and McCausland, the import of the judgment was that a British protected person is protected against everyone except the British. Moving now to uh, possible ways to frame uh, these issues theoretically. Brenna Bunder has argued that racial subjects and modern property laws are produced through one another in the colonial context. Bunder argues that ownership and control of property was not just dependent on race and settler colonies, but the race was and remains substended, subtended by property logics that determine whose ways of holding and valuing land is worthy of legal recognition and protection. And Bandar explores notions of improvement as central to this racial subjectivity, citing Ranajit Guha's history of property in Bengal as a reminder of England's long history as improving landlord. Similarly, in his essay on property and empire, 
a theme to which he turned in the 2000s, Patrick McCausland explored how ideologies of improvement were developed first in Ireland. He shows how this outlook on property that spread throughout the colonial conquest uh, of the world had its origins in Irish colonialism. And it's captured in the justification, indeed the injunction provided by Sir John Davies, the English Attorney General for Ireland, in a letter to the Earl of Salisbury in 1610, to the effect that the king was not only entitled in law, but bound in conscience to seize land and enact the formal replacement of Irish land law by English common law, in order to reduce his people from barbarity to civility. This, because in the words of Sir John Davies, if the natives were suffered to possess the whole country, they would never, to the end of the world, build houses, make townships or villages, or manure, or improve the land as it ought to be. Both authors, Brenna Bunda and Patrick McCausland, have in common a concern with settler colonialism as an ontological project. Bunda's focus on racial regimes of property leads her to important insights on the intimacy of colonialism, citing Fanon's observation that the settler and the native are old acquaintances. Bunda stresses the psycho-affective dimensions, dimensions of racial property regimes. For her, property law must be understood as a form of colonial domination. The experience of indigenous people in Kenya lends itself to a similar analysis. Joel Gugi has argued that the, the domination of the Maasai was taken to be necessary as part of a modernizing, improving and civilizing impetus. The Maasai ca uh, case provides an excellent example of the instrumentality of the law as a device aimed at modernist development, as Guy and McCausland showed in their 1970 text in relation to agrarian policy asserted through administrative rules deprecated by a racial colonial land regime that refused to acknowledge communal relations to land. In the post-colonial era, the state's domination of indigenous people was a continuation of this racial regime of ownership. The term that has come to be used for these losses and the domineering practices that have underpinned them is historical land injustices, a term that has firmly taken hold in Kenya's constitutional and political lexicon. It was used, for example, during the elongated process of constitutional review, not at least by civil society activism. There's scarcely a region of Kenya that has not suffered from historical land injustices, whether by displacement to make way for European settlers or to create game reserves through evictions for mining concessions or for, from forests, or by displacement as a result of politically motivated clashes or irregular and illegal land allocation. If I have this evening taken the Maasai case and as an example of land claims stretching back into the colonial period over which unresolved questions and claims still hang today, they are by no means an isolated example. We can cite here the Enderoy's people's claims that they are indigenous to Lake Bogoria, the historical land injustices experienced by hunter-gatherer communities such as the Ogiek and the Sengwer, and so on. The label historical land injustice has come to be used as something of a shorthand for a range of land wrongs. It's entered policy and legal arenas whilst at the same time having multiple meanings in popular archives, in the popular everyday language and daily politics of those who struggle over land. But the slow pace of material change for indigenous communities and the marked reluctance of the Kenyan state to implement Kate ruling, uh, court rulings in their favor requires us to consider historical and present day land claims in a broader context and in particular to explore their connection with the wider political economy. The present day economy is deeply rooted in the racial exclusivity of the colonial period. Issa Shivji has written about how the dispossession by racial exclusivity of the colonial period transmogrified 
uh, into an ethnicized land question on independence. When enclaves of super exploitation and racial privilege uh, were Kenyanized and low land ownership was no longer racialized, the fundamental relations of production and accumulation didn't change. When racial privilege privileges were replaced by ethnic preferences underwritten by a neo-colonial state, a deeply conservative structure was bequeathed to Kenyan politics. There is therefore nothing past about historical land injustices. In the present day, land injustices are sedimented in the political economy. By this, I mean that the normal economy is founded on accumulation by dispossession. It's not possible to isolate present and past historical land injustices, and it's not possible to understand Kenya's political economy absent an understanding of how the normal and the supposedly abnormal corruption, land grabbing, so on, are codependent. Refusing a neat temporal account of land injustices also requires us to refuse an account of historical land injustices that seals it off or seals itself off from the properly functioning uh, politics and economy of the country. Taking seriously the continuities between the colonial past and the recolonizing practices of the present uh, enables us to see how these, have, how these injustices have deepened in the present, structuring the economy, determining who owns what, and deeply affecting class formation. Although a neat temporal break is inscribed in law and policy, and is necessary in order to process claims, that's understood, it is still conceptually inaccurate. We can learn a great deal here from legal frameworks for land restitution in South Africa, which similarly fails to grasp the psychological and social harms done by apartheid, but framed land wrongs instead as unjust takings that could be reversed. Rue describes the attitude of lawyers as a simplistic one that viewed apartheid as a legal scheme which could simply be unlegislated. To think in this way, in the way that I'm suggesting, to co complexify historical land injustices imposes an evidential burden beyond the empirical and factual claims to a, give, to a given territory. As Kep and Hall, drawing on Krog, have argued in relation to South Africa, what is being sought in the idea of, of reclaiming is not merely a return of land lost, but a new relationship with land, in which land is not merely owned, but in which people identify with and are instead owned by the land. Rather than a claim of first peoples, it is an assertion that a given group has not had access to the fruits of development. Claims for recognition cannot be neatly set in opposition to claims for redistribution. As Nancy Fraser herself has argued in calling for a more nuanced understanding of her formulation of the politics of recognition, not all forms of recognition politics are equally pernicious. Some represent genuinely emancipatory responses to serious injustices. Properly conceived struggles for recognition can also aid the redistribution of power. Calls by indigenous groups for recognition are also inherently uh, calls for a different way of distributing resources and power within the state. Failed by the post-independent state, first by being deprived of access to their most vital means of production and reproduction, and then by a failure of the courts to recognize their legal struggles, this politis, politics of recognition is central uh, to, to the claims of indigenous people today. As Korea Singoy has argued convincingly, the court showed themselves at something of a loss when confronted with land claims of indigenous people framed as by different epistemologies. 
claims that mobilize evidence of community and history come up against state-sanctioned framings of property as properly evidenced by paper and by title. Senghor rightly points to the manifest failure of the courts to respond adequately to historical land claims as itself a further aspect of the domination of indigenous people who make claims not to separate territorial uh, places, but also ontological claims. So Gothagendo describes this pithily when he notes, the commons are constituted not merely by territoriality or by the temporal aggregation of members of any given entity, but are in addition characterized by important ontological factors, amongst which is their permanent availability across generations, past, present, and future. For these societies, which recognize and depend on them, Agatha Genda writes, the commons are a creative force in social production and reproduction. How are we to then think through the implications of some of this for present day jurisprudence? And I'll um, cover this, this only very briefly to make a few uh, brief suggestions. Um, and for the benefit of, of the lawyers amongst us, you, you know, who have been in the last few weeks considering a couple of, of leading judgments uh, by the Kenyan courts and critiquing them, I'll point uh, to the William Musembi uh, judgment, which, which many of us have, have written about and, uh, and even celebrated, but that I think uh, would merit uh, a framing in the way that I've suggested this evening to understand that there is really no operative distinction in Kenya between public and private actors. So that uh, on the one hand, we're glad to see the extension of constitutional obligations by, by the case to private actors. But on the other, we need to guard against the risk, which we saw very much in this judgment, that the respondent's title was effectively sanctioned, effectively, uh, by the Supreme Court uh, confirmed as unimpeached. So that unless the National Land Commission or the Environment and Land Court are, are asked to uh, rule on the propriety of, of the, the first respondent's title, what we have here is effectively uh, uh, the court confirming an unimpeachable title, presenting quite a windfall uh, to, to the first respondent because it didn't adequately, in my view, think through the implications of the distinction that it sought to make between public and private actors. And I would maintain there is no operative distinction. And then secondly, again, for the lawyers amongst us, and this, this is a, some early thoughts from me on the Lake Turkana, wind power, judgment, not an evictions judgment, it's true, well, not in the strictest sense. Uh, but here again, I was disappointed to see, uh, although happy with the outcome, disappointed to see uh, the treatment of the, of the court in relation to the plaintiff's allegation that their cultural and social rights were violated. And if you look at paragraphs 128 and 129 of that judgment, you'll see what evidence was placed before the court. And I think uh, that it was inevitable that the court would find that the plaintiffs hadn't demonstrated uh, any violations because the conceptual work that needed to be done to place before the courts evidence of harm in this case wasn't done. And I, I raise these two cases just briefly in, uh, in ending this lecture because I think it's important for some of the theoretical uh, framing that I've tried to suggest is necessary this evening to be brought through cases such as this so that we're not uh, we're not finding very good outcomes, no doubt, but that our jurisprudence simply is impoverished by a lack of understanding of what ontological uh, as well as material harms occur in, in cases related to land, including in evictions cases. So to end, I've suggested in this lecture that in order fully to understand land wrongs, we must recognize the complex intertemporalities of past and present in the land domain. 
legal and policy approaches to historical land injustices, which seek to separate these wrongs from the regular workings of the economy, will fail to grasp the complexity of land wrongs. I have suggested that it's important to recognise the close and pervasive links between the injustices visited on Indigenous and other people and the regular functioning of the economy. Addressing historical land wrongs demands that we see how they've become imbricated in the political economy of the present day since the period of colonial dispossession of which Guy and McCausland wrote. Asante ni sana ichi. Wonderful. Thank you very much. What a fantastic lecture, uh, Ambrina. And um, we've got questions coming down the, the line. And uh, perhaps it would be good if I um, linked something that one of your first questioners, um, B. K. Piozo, is asking you, which is, could the concept of land in Kenya mean also the concept of land in Africa when it comes to land ownership? In other words, is there any common denominator that cuts across the concept of land ownership in, mm. in Africa? And I wanted to ask you that question too, because I wanted to understand what is it that we might learn from the Kenyan case mm. uh, that we could apply elsewhere? And I think that's perhaps what B is asking you also mm. in part, yeah? Mm -hmm. so perhaps we could start with that as the opener, yeah? It's, it's, it's a great question, and I think what I would want to do in response is to decenter ownership mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, to, and, to, and to call into question why we must frame uh, the debate in terms of land ownership. So what I've seen happen, and, and, and I think it's a really important development to point out, and this is true in Kenya, but it's also true across the continent, is that the language of ownership has been called into question, including at, at um, global level in terms of global land policy by the World Bank. So when I started to work on land, for example, 25 years ago, uh, communal land holding, or the idea of community land was very much deprecated. Mm -hmm. It was something that was outmoded, that would be surpassed as time went on, as individual titling and registration and all of its benefits became clearer. Community land was a was a residual category. In global policy land policy terms, that is no longer the case. Mm. We, in, in, and I, I find it really quite surprising that in 20 or 25 years we've reached a place where uh, land policy at the global level and across the continent, not just in, in our constitution in Kenya, recognizes the persistence of community land, but not just its persistence, its role in preserving uh, custodianship over land, which is so important, for example, for the kind of environmental debates that or climate change debates where we're having now. And so I think I think uh, that change has been important. And actually, it's important to acknowledge that that change has happened partly because of the struggles of indigenous people. Yeah. who, despite their marginalization and despite the fact that court orders have, have, been, uh, have, have not been implemented, have continued to show why community land, why communal ways of holding land are important in material terms and in ontological terms. And for us, in, in, in terms of the, the development of our theoretical frame, frameworks on, on land. Mm. It's a difficult one, though, one, isn't it? I, I mean, the <clears throat> one of the things you said early on, which I thought was absolutely right, was that land redistribution is always dis, is always <clears throat> excluded from the discussion of what is possible. And I think one of the reasons why that happens, it happens all across the world. So this is a, <clears throat> a question I think that, again, B is point, pointing to you towards, uh, is that there is this connection between a fundamental connection between property rights, individual identity, and agency, which is still, which is both supporting this communal movement that you describe, mm -hmm. and also the thing that allows people to be dispossessed from it because it's the thing that you're excluded that you're excluded from. So there is a very very difficult underpinning there, which isn't actually, in a way, dealt with by the, the communal the communal claim. I mean, there's a, there's a chance, in fact, that the communal claim is re reasserting it, but yes. just managing to make itself heard better, mm -hmm. rather than actually fundamentally 
um, you know, sundering that relationship. And I think our courts have to be careful not to do the same thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's very, that's the point you made. It's very interesting. And so there was a follow-up question as well, in a, in a, in a way, from Felix uh, Uitonze, who's saying, there is a country that I don't want to mention where the landlord provides equal access to land without discrimination based on sex or origin. The law provides further guidance on land access through emphytutic leases. For most agricultural land in rural areas, the leasehold period is 99 years renewable. Mm -hmm. I'm asking Professor Ambrina, what does she think on this law? Because some citizens are saying they're not happy with it, which I'm not surprised about. But so this notion of improvement is also here, isn't it, in this place? It is. And I think, and, and I was uh, talking to colleagues about this uh, earlier this week. It's interesting, isn't it, in, in, uh, in our own debates in Kenya, how... Um, the question of, of um, minimum and maximum land ceilings yeah. has, has uh, fallen into the debate that we should have been having has fallen into, into abeyance. And I think that that's connected um, both the question of the 99 year lease, but also I think debates, redistributive debates mm. about uh, maximum land holdings and minimum land holdings seem not to be on the political agenda at all, despite the constitution and then subsequently the 2012 land legislation providing that the, um, the uh, National Land Commission would, would carry out research on this question. And it seems to me that it's, it's not possible um, to think about uh, land redistribution without actually and and the core question of, of the the period of holding the lease but without thinking about that bigger question of of minimum and maximum land holding not of course favored but at global uh, land policy level at all we know for example how much India was discouraged from that debate uh, and and how how likely we are also, Yes. Well, we've got a series of questions which are sort of um, following on from some of this, from, from um, Douglas Amande, from Imali Ngosale, and from Gosego Ekogwe, and they're all asking a series of interconnected questions. So one is, how can we solve these land problems in Kenya? We've got the government establishing land commission and acts of parliament on land, so what needs to be done to push that forward? Mm. And then Imali is asking, on the historical land injustices, do you think the colonially instituted law intentionally lacked an African epistemic interpretation of customary Kenyan norms? Yeah. And Goseko is asking, how does this work? Can you comment on South Africa and Zimbabwe's attempts to rectify the land problem? So all this speaking about how, mm. do, how, how do we do it? Is it a question of an epistemic problem? You know, if you have the processes in place, why don't they work kind of thing? If you have the conditions in place. So what I've tried to do in this lecture is not to, uh, not to suggest at the policy level what we might do, but, but instead to urge us to think about a different conceptual framing that might get us a little bit further ahead than right. we currently are. And what I mean by that is that um, it, it works in law, of course it does, um, to, to frame historical land injustice claims in the way that the law does, to say there is this cutoff date, uh, these are the things that you must show in order for your claim to be entertained, etc. That is under, understood. But what I think we need to understand conceptually is that the, that the continuities mm -hmm. uh, between past wrongs and present wrongs make this all very difficult to disentangle. So it's that conceptual work that I'm urging us to do rather than, and you know, and it would be a, it would be a very happy person that could suggest how any of this might be unpicked in in legal and policy terms i think we made we made great headway in the constitution i think having chapter 5 of the constitution that set out the provisions on on land that it did mm -hmm. 
was important, I think, to have a, a national land policy did, that did that. And then subsequently land legislation that tried to make those constitutional aspirations concrete. Those were all important gains. But I think what's lacking in the land domain for us is, is still the kind of conceptual theoretical work that I've been um, trying to do this evening to understand when we make land claims, we're not just making uh, first people's claims, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. We're not just making uh, claims to material parcels of land. We're also making ontological claims. Yes. Right. And yeah. that I think is and that our courts aren't quite doing that yet. So in the um, wind farm case that I just very briefly um, went over at the end of my lecture there, what you see the courts doing is confronted with evidence of um, what are the social and cultural harms that have been done to this, this peoples. Uh, they brought in the national museums, they brought in archaeologists, they heard evidence and the archaeologists said, well, actually, the, the relevant cultural sites of these people are not affected because they're up on the hill and this wind farm is down on the plain. That's a very impoverished view of what the social and cultural rights of a people might be. Mm. That's what I'm trying to urge us to do this evening and for the courts to think about more broadly is what does it mean for people to be cut off from its land ontologically, not just materially? And what is the full gamut of a, a people's social and cultural rights? So, so my answer to those questions is you know, I'm not able to give an answer about how we might resolve some of these, what we know are intractable difficulties, but we'd go some way towards confronting them if we recognize that they're not in the past, that, mm. that, that these land wrongs are sedimented in our current economy. And I think that is really very important to recognize, that there's nothing aberrant about our current political economy that's deeply connected to the way in which um, past land wrongs were committed. Yes. We've got a couple of questions, though, that, are, that, again, are sort of following up from there. One is from Peter Lockwood and one is from Matt Davis. So Peter's mm. question is, um, you know, what sorts of sort of communitar communitarian orientalist tropes about the Maasai, do you think, might have fed into their in, into the notion of their sovereignty in this in this question, whether, the, you know, the mm. British administration were um both denying them and giving them degrees mm -hmm. of sovereignty. And he's mm -hmm. talking about the Kikuyu case in the Carter Commission. But Matt is also saying that something about these legal judgments seems to rest on the idea that you can make a clear distinction between people and land as, as mm -hmm. distinct classes of things, and perhaps you can't. So both of them are asking you to reflect on this, on this question of what does ownership mean in this space? Mm. Or how is it mm. understood? What is, the, mm. uh, what is the symbolic or ontological underpinning? And you use the word ontology a couple of times yourself in the, in the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm adumbrating their questions and I apologize, Mr. Lockwood and Mr. Davis, but I'm worried about time, so. But they're great questions. Yeah. Um, and actually uh, they are questions, I think, for me, they're questions that our courts need to confront. Yeah. So, so Pete's question about um, the kinds of tropes at play. I yeah. think, I think, I think we could ask like, a similar question in 2021 about the wind farms case. Uh, what sorts of notions of of social and cultural rights were at play that enabled the courts to to bring in really quite thin evidence of how the people were affected, mm. uh, and then to simply rule well, actually you you know your the wrongs you you allege in relation to your cultural rights we 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 find uh, yeah. not to, not to be upheld. Yeah. Um, so there is I think something really important and and, and there about. Um, you can't separate out assumptions about a peoples from assumptions about how they are connected with their lands. And, 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 the, and Matt is quite right, mm. that, the, that, that part, of the, um, part of the difficulty that a court has is how do you read 
uh, these claims? How do you understand when, 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 when a law court is set up to understand individual registration, to understand title, to understand pieces of paper? How do you understand these wider claims? Korea Sengoy talks about this. How do you understand these bigger ontological claims about your, how does the court understand these bigger ontological claims about your connection with land and what that means, or particularly what your what losses uh, accrue when you lose land. So here we're talking not just about loss of a productive resource, and this goes back to the whole question of reproductive labour. It's also about your uh, loss of reproductive uh Assets, assets that allow you to pass on generationally your custodianship of the land, that allow you to practice your uh, your your spirituality, your religion, and so on. The courts have great difficulty understanding any of that, and the, seeing this through through um, the idea of the tropes that the, law, the court plays with is actually really suggestive and productive. And I thank you for that question. Mm. Well, we're just we're coming running out of time as we always do when we enjoy ourselves on these occasions. But two questions that have come up and they're they're they're, they're linked. They're asking you both about the limitations of the legal framework. So one mm. by Gauta Mbatia, who's saying, with respect to your critique of Mitu Bell, doesn't mm. it also reflect the limits of law or litigation? The mm. form of litigation itself presumes the validity of existing distributional arrangements. Yeah. yeah. Right, so the problem yep. seems less with jurisprudence and more with what you can can or can't achieve through the route of litigation. Mm -hmm. And Martha Gayoye is saying, do you agree with the constitutional interest in land framed by the Supreme Court in the William Mosembe case that can potentially trump, trump private rights? Is that even possible or wishful thinking? In other words, where are the, where are the law making its own limits here and where is yeah. it constrained yeah. by things? They're great interrelated questions. Mm. So, so, um, Martha, I think I'm happy, you know, many of us are celebrating the outcome of the case for all the reasons that, for example, Gautam Bhatia wrote about oh. this extension uh, to, to um, responsibility of private actors. But in doing that, if you then are also um, having to construct the title as unimpeached, you're making a really dangerous move there. You're effectively giving kind of almost unasked and un unbidden, you're giving uh, the respondent a, a, a windfall, confirming title. And I just think the courts need, need to be really careful about doing that in order to build a you know, really quite beautiful jurisprudential uh, outcome. Uh, and and to, to the first question on the limits of litigation, absolutely. So those of us who were at the 10th anniversary celebrations of the Katiba, the constitution in, in, in August last year were, were uh, duly reminded by Issa Shivji as we all expected uh, about the limits of, of uh, litigation and even the constitution in changing the distribution mm -hmm. of power and reminded of the role of uh, uh, social movements and and uh, you know the risk the real possibility that actually the progressive change that social movements want often gets get surpassed by quashed by uh, this focus on on legal change so that's a very well taken point about the limits of 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 litigation and it i allude to it at the beginning of the lecture when i talk about our constitutional optimism mm. we're not the only country to suffer from it no, by no means, by, by no means. Well, and been an absolutely fantastic lecture and thank you so much. I mean, we are so grateful and, um, and indeed profoundly uh, impressed by this wonderful work that you've been doing on land. And, and speaking from that Kenyan position, so important, I think, for understanding many, many, many things. Um, we have following uh, Professor Mandy's lecture, a, a small part of the celebration to continue just for a moment and so I'm now going to uh, just briefly introduce and offer the floor to Professor uh, Julia Black who is the president of the British Academy. Um, professor Black is a distinguished professor of law at the London School of Economics with interests in the dynamics and legitimacy of regulatory systems and she sits on 
quite a number of important committees in the Bank of England, so must be very busy at this time, and is also a senior independent member of the board of the UK's Board of Research and Innovation, which is the UK's main research funding body, and also on the board of the Courtauld Institute of Art, which must be the best fun of all. So, um, Professor Black, welcome to the British Institute in Eastern Africa. And can I offer you the floor and invite you to make a few comments? Oh, thank you so much, Anita. And, um, and also thank you, Changbrina, absolutely fascinating lecture, really challenging topic, and you uh, forced us to to start thinking about things in, in a slightly different way and, and how we approach these, these really complex and intractable issues. Fantastic questions as well. And it's a discussion and a debate. Actually, we could have gone on and on this evening, yeah. but unfortunately we don't have the time for that. <laughs> but my role, um, a part of my role tonight actually is to, is to thank Professor Moore for her exceptional uh, leadership at the British Institute of East Africa through what has been possibly one of the most challenging periods <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that could have been thought of. So she has steered the, the BIEA through periods that have seen changes in the regulatory framework in Kenya, which have governed NGOs and research institutes, which obviously have direct impact. Um, they've also to steer us through the different funding crises that we've had in the UK, government funding for research, um, certainly since the global financial crisis. Uh, and that has had its own challenges uh, for the Institute. In addition, there have been multiple challenges in Kenya from terrorist attacks in Nairobi, periods of political tension, to deteriorating economic conditions, and then, and then COVID, and the need to develop entirely new working practices uh, during the COVID pandemic. And through that, you have been absolutely steadfast in your, in your commitment to the Institute, in your commitment to the staff, uh, and in your commitment to, to ensuring that the Institute not just survived, as, as they say, but genuinely, genuinely thrived. And you have led and developed the, the Institute through a successful and major research project of Procol, generated numerous funding schemes in the, to research. You've developed the BIA's research themes, established new committees in the UK to actually really build those connections, something I'm really, really keen to, to foster, um, and in my particular Kind of presidency of the academy, overseeing a widening and refreshing of the governing council, rebranding the BIA, diversifying the audiences, really opening it out. And I think there's a lot there that we can take from what you've been doing the BIA to feed back into the academy more broadly in terms of really opening up and diversifying and making its relevance directly felt. So I, I really, really can't thank you enough, actually, for your not just steadfast, but absolutely inspirational leadership. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's, it has been a pleasure and a privilege to have been the president of the BIA, and not least because of the wonderful people who are involved in the BIA and all of the collaborative links and partnerships that we have in Africa, which makes all this work possible, this great work possible that we do and that, that Ambrina was talking about um, tonight. And um, I will in no sense be leaving the BIA. I first got involved Good. in the BIA more than 40 years ago. So as far as I can work out, it's a lifetime commitment. <laughs> and I'm not likely to be able to give up at any moment. But the, um, the interesting thing I think that many on the, the call would, would, would appreciate from you, Julia, is you know, some words around how you, how you now see the sort of challenges that are facing the humanities and the social sciences, because of course for Africa, this is really important, the role that the humanities and social sciences will play going forward. Uh, and it's clear how the work of someone like Ambrina speaks directly to those things. But I know that, you know, in the, 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 the British Academy's submission to the spending, the UK government spending review and, and so on, and the new framework that the British Academy has been developing around the shape agenda, so for the social science. So would, I think, that, that many on the call tonight would have, would, have, would appreciate just, I know that uh, you don't have much time, but appreciate just a few words from you on, on how you see the role of the social sciences and humanities in tackling this post-COVID situation and these big challenges like land yeah. and so on. No, absolutely. And thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to do so. So quite, quite fundamentally, social sciences, humanities and arts are absolutely fundamental to how we how we move forward um, through not only just through COVID and uh, through the inequalities and challenges that have 
been created, but also revealed through COVID, but also through tackling other key challenges that we have, uh, climate change obviously being absolutely core central uh, to the central to those. Uh, you know, COP26 is obviously proceeding as we speak. And the idea for behind the, the sh- behind the, the notion of shape is that by by creating a, a common a common term for social sciences, humanities, and the arts, we can hopefully empower those who are part of those disciplines to create a common narrative, but one that really emphasizes our absolute centrality to any issues that focus on people and societies across time and space, Mm. because that is fundamentally what we focus on. We may differ in our methodologies, we may differ in our mindsets, we may differ in, in our different approaches, but understanding people and societies is core you cannot and and also therefore however not to set up this you know not to go back to the two cultures between science and and the arts and humanities but to recognize that actually we need to understand those two together it's when the stem and and the shape subjects really work together at a very fundamental level that we can really advance and that's where that's where a really innovative cutting-edge research can take place but also how we can as I say, really start to really pay a part in tackling some of the big issues uh, that we all face today. So, and the academy is absolutely central to that, along with others. But because we are the National Academy for Humanities and Social Sciences, I think we have a responsibility to to engage across the base. And that's why I'm so welcome the research and the, the way that you've been taking the BIEA in terms of opening out, including all sorts of different actors and stakeholders, academic and non-academic, working with the NGO community, working with civil society, working with business, working with government, to really bring the benefit and mobilise our knowledge and insights and ideas in a way that really is for the force for good, but for helping societies and helping us move forward. And so from the Academy's point of view, it's we've you know, been working in this way for, for some time now, and it's really what I would like to do during of my privileges I have, I think I'm probably one of the luckiest people actually, to, to really double down on that, as it were, and to really open up the academy and to really bring in other voices, um, other insights from uh, different perspectives so that we can bring that diversity together. So as I say, we can really take our knowledge, insights, our ideas and mobilise them in the most effective way possible mm. for the good of, for the, for the good. For the good, yeah. Yeah, well, wonderful, absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Well, thank, thank you for that, and and for being with us this evening. And I hope that's pleasure. I, 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 I'm fascinated. <laughs> I hope that will be a long, a long connection for you and your as your time as president. Very much so. Here with the, with the British Institute East in, in Africa. But before we close, I I just would like to um, introduce. Um, Professor Justin Willis, who is the newly elected president of the British Institute in Eastern Africa. Professor Willis is Professor of Modern African History at the University of Durham. He's also a former director of the uh, BIA itself in in Nairobi. So Justin, congratulations and welcome uh, to your new role. Um, We're all thrilled that you have agreed to take it on and um, and 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 very um, grateful that um, that you will be at the helm of what will undoubtedly be a very challenging position coming out of the out of COVID. I hope as we as we go forward. But I wonder if you'd just like to say a, a, a few words to everyone tonight who's on the on the call for the lecture. Yes, I, I would. Thank you very much, Henrietta. And, and by the way, thank you also, Professor Black. And thanks, Ambrina, for fantastic lecture. I loved it. Um, I I don't want to repeat what has already been said, but I really must express my appreciation of Henrietta's work at BIA. Um, Her leadership has taken BIA through a period of really quite remarkable challenge, as Professor Black has indicated. But more than that, it's helped to change what BIA is and how it works in really positive and creative ways. Now, this is a hard act to follow, large shoes to fill, whatever metaphor you choose. Uh, But I'm very honoured, first of all, that Council and the membership have uh, placed the trust in me to to try to do that. 
Uh, and I'm very aware, as Henrietta has suggested, that the challenges are by no means over. Um, and I would like to say very clearly that I intend to take my example from Henrietta in a very fundamental way, which is that BIA has changed and it will change more. This will not alter BIA's core charitable purpose, which is to support, promote and disseminate humanities and social sciences research in and on Eastern Africa. That commitment continues and it's rooted in a sense of the fundamental importance of that kind of research, which I think goes to what Professor Black was saying about a shared sense of what I now know to call the shape agenda. <laughs> um, but change will continue because we look forward to a future where the emphasis is more than ever on co-production and on partnership in research. Research is, must be a shared endeavor and UK research can only thrive through co-production and partnership with researchers and research users and communities in Eastern Africa and beyond. And that is, that's the role and the purpose of BIA is to make that co-production and that partnership possible. As a research community, we will grow together or not at all. So BIA is committed to that co-production, to partnership, and I look forward very much to working with council, with the members of BIA, and with a much wider community with which we engage, and indeed, of course, with the British Academy. So I look forward to this very much. It is a challenge, and I thank Henrietta. And before I go, I'd like to hand over very briefly to our director, uh, Jane Humphreys, who's going to say just a little about coming events. Jane. Thank you, Justin. Um, before I take the opportunity to mention some of the upcoming events that we've got going on at the BIA, I of course also want to thank Professor Manji for a really fascinating and thought provoking um, lecture and to all of the, the panelists who've spoken to us today. So thank you very much. I also want to say a special thank you to the BIA staff who work tire tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure that our numerous uh, online events run smoothly. So thank you very much. Um, to you. So in addition to our usual busy schedule of workshops, conferences and book launches, we have got several upcoming and ongoing events that I want to draw your attention to. Professor Manji already mentioned our year long introduction to research processes course, which this month is focusing on the themes, the fundamental themes of ethics, risk assessments and data management in research. So we continue this course next Thursday with the BIA's research fellow, Dr. Alice Gathoni, drawing on her experience to talk to you about uh, the ethical considerations of working with vulnerable populations. But before that, and actually happening tomorrow and Friday, we have the BIA's graduate conference. This is an annual event. And this year, the graduate conference focuses on the very pertinent theme of living in changing environments. And it's got a really fantastic lineup. So I encourage you all to take a look at that. And this year sees the first ever BIA annual conference. So this annual conference will start on the 17th of November and run over four afternoons. Uh, between then and the middle of December. And the themes are uh, organized around the BIA's research themes of retelling the past, changing environments, urban lives, technology of politics, next generations, and epidemics and pandemics. So I hope you will all register for some of these events so that we can welcome you again to the BIA's community. Do keep up to date with the BIA's website where you can find out all about the great research we're conducting and participating in and where you can find out about all of the opportunities we have uh, to help you in your research um, agendas. So with that, I will wish you all a very pleasant evening uh, and we hope to see you all very, very soon. So thank you all very, very much for joining and participating. Yeah, and thank you, Ambrina, for the most marvellous lecture. The panellists can clap because you're, <laughs> even though we're virtual, we can see you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Black, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for being with us. And we hope to see you very soon at the BIA. Don't forget us. Come and join in. It's a lot of fun to hang out with us. Good evening, everyone.